Hello, College Chem 2. Welcome back after spring break. Things are going to be a little different, but we'll try to make it work. So this is the format we'll most likely have for, I don't know if it's going to be the rest of the semester, but for the next couple of weeks at least. Um, so just we are two tests in. We have one more big test to go before the final. So three more chapters. We have this chapter that we're going to start on today. Then we have a chapter on electrochemistry and we'll finish up with an organic chemistry chapter and then we'll be done and you'll be done with, with high school. Sorry, this last semester isn't probably how you thought it was going to go. Anyway, this chapter is going to help us figure out whether a reaction actually happens or not. We'll use the word spontaneous and non-spontaneous quite a bit. So let me mention that this is technically chapter 17, but only if you have the 13th, 14th, or 15th edition. Um, if you have the copy I gave you, that was the 10th edition, it's chapter 18. So that's why it might look different or why you might see different numbers. Um, now, same homework. Here are the numbers. The numbers are the same in both editions, so that's fantastic. And I'll set up a Google Classroom assignment so you can turn that in digitally because you probably won't be able to hand this one in. So to get started, we got some basic review. We know that all energy in the universe is conserved. So the overall delta E is not going to change. And over here, we, we know that whatever energy leaves or enters our system, it's because it's going to or from the opposite to the surrounding. So here we have this nice little flamethrower. Um, I included a link in the notes if you want to go and watch the longer version, but we have propane reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. So this is exothermic. And so the chemicals are going to lower energy states and we know it's because they're releasing that energy to the surroundings. So <clears throat> we have energy lost by combustion, but thermal energy gain. So the overall energy of the universe stays zero. Um, so again, we use, these we use this word enthalpy to talk about heat flow. Um, and it is under constant pressure situation, which we're normally going to assume. That's not always the case, but we're just going to make things easier. Um, and so we know that things that are exothermic have a negative delta H. Endothermic, where it absorbs energy, has a positive delta H. And so for every chemical reaction, there is some combination of absorption of energy when bonds get disrupted and a release of energy when new bonds get formed. And then whether the whole reaction is exo or endothermic depends on that combination. I wish this little toggle bar here wouldn't pop up, but I, I can't. It's, it's just going to be there. Go ahead. Okay, so moving on. So again, we, we want to know, you can look at this figure of two people skiing. If I were to ask you, hey, which one looks spontaneous? You could probably guess that one of them in red, yep, that, that's going to happen. But the guy skiing uphill, that's probably not spontaneous. So that's what we want to figure out in this chapter is will a reaction happen? So we know that, yeah, if you watch water at the top of a hill, it's going to go down thanks to gravity. We know that if you um, bring water below zero degrees Celsius, it's going to freeze. But if you bring it above zero degrees Celsius, it's going to melt. We know if you put sugar into coffee, it's going to dissolve. If you touch something that is cold, it's going to take thermal energy from you and go into that cold object. We know some reactions like just leave iron out, it's going to rust. It's going to be spontaneous. Um, if you have a whole bunch of gas in one side of a chamber and it's lower, there's less on the other, when you allow them to mix, it's, it's going to spontaneously move from one side to the other. So again, what we want to know is why are some things spontaneous but not the other? Like you wouldn't expect to see... Um, this happens spontaneously where that just goes in the reverse direction. That's, that's not likely to happen. <clears throat> so to figure out if it's spontaneous, there's one thing we've already talked about, and that's enthalpy. So it's very, very, very common for chemical reactions to release energy where they go to a lower energy state. That is, their, their overall energy level 
drops. So we see negative delta H's. And so there's lots of examples of that. Combustion of methane, yep, that's exothermic. Um, when you, a neutralization reaction of an acid in a base, that's exothermic. Uh, even the Haber process, um, nitrogen and hydrogen, exothermic. So all of these, we have these negative values and it's very common because that's able to release. So all of these are exothermic, um, but we do know that if you take, um, you, you take ice, it can melt. That is an endothermic process. It's positive six kilojoules per mole. Um, ammonium nitrate. Last semester, we dissolved some in water and the water got cold. This, uh, this is the stuff used in instant ice packs. So that dissolution of ammonium nitrate is endothermic. So that both of those have to absorb energy. And so just because it's exothermic doesn't necessarily mean it will always be spontaneous or it doesn't have to be. So for that, we have to look at this other thing called entropy. So entropy is another thermodynamic quantity that is going to work with enthalpy to determine whether something is spontaneous or not. Okay, so let's, let's look at entropy. Um, so I've, I've talked briefly about this before. It's a measure of randomness, disorder of, of the energy or matter in a system. And it, you could think of it as all the different possible ways it could be arranged. And so we say if the, thing, if the order goes up, then that means there is less entropy. But if disorder goes up, if it's more random and more chaotic, then that's an increase in entropy. And so we're always going to be talking of generally about the change in entropy. So that's delta S. Um, and yeah, that's blah, 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 blah. Um, and so for starters, we could, again, just talking about order, think about a solid versus liquid versus gas. So solids have a crystal lattice. Most, um, they're highly organized, so they have very, very, very little entropy. However, when you get to liquids, Liquids have uh, more dynamic systems. Particles can move and shift about. And so it would say it's more chaotic. There's more entropy. And then gases, they're completely broken free from each other. Particles are very spread out and diffuse even higher entropy. So here we, we have the sub, we have the evaporation of bromine from a liquid to a gas. We would say there is an increase in entropy. The delta S would be positive. Um, here's a fun link that if we were in class, we would watch, but we're not going to for the video, but you can just as well go and click on it and watch it yourself. I, I hope you do. So again, we can, we can describe entropy statistically by just looking at the probabilities of arrangement. So imagine there are these two boxes, one, two, and there's four different molecules. So the chances of all four being in one box, there's, there's really just one way. It could either be all here or all four could be there, but that would really be the same thing. So there's only one way you could distribute all four molecules in these two compartments. But imagine if it was in a three to one ratio. So here's a possibility and there's a possibility there and there. So there are four different ways you could arrange uh, this this distribution. Well, what if it's two and two? Well, now there are six different possibilities. And so of all of the different ways you can arrange just these tiny four molecules in these two compartments, the most probable is going to be number six. You could say it's the most distributed, the most chaotic. It would be less likely if you were to just randomly throw molecules in these two boxes, the least likely would be to get in, in this first one where all four just happen to be in the very same. So um, in the book, it talks about microstates. And so these this W is um, the number of possibilities that there could be. And so there's 11 different microstates of, if you were to count up the number of these possibilities. And the most likely is going to be this one because there's just way more uh, chances that it would end up in that state. So this, this can be described quantitatively, this, this entropy with this equation. 
So we have K is the Boltzmann's constant, um, and you can read about Boltzmann in the in the text. Again, pretty much a statistician um, physicist who worked out this these statistical probabilities, and here it's worked out into this tiny little value of how many joules per Kelvin. Uh, w is just the number of microstates, and so if we're interested in the change in entropy, then we have this natural log component. Um, so we're interested in, is the entropy going to go up or down? And the short of all of this is that if the process leads to a greater number of microstates, there's going to be more entropy, and that's going to be more likely. So again, this whole idea of entropy is if it goes up, if things get more dispersed, disordered, chaotic. So imagine a solid melting, that's an increase of entropy. A liquid vaporizing, that's an increase of entropy. Just dissolving a solid, disrupting this crystal lattice, that's more entropy. Just heating a substance, so there's more vibrational, there's, there's more different types. And then we also have chemical reactions. So we talked about this with Avogadro's Law before. Um, but with Avogadro's Law, we looked at how many moles of gases were changing. And if the number of moles of gas, in this case, two becoming four goes up, we would say then the reaction is doing work. Well, here we'll say, again, if you have more moles of gas than when you start, there's also an increase of entropy because there's more matter, more dispersed. So again, we're looking at just moles of gas formed or taken away. Um, now, again, in talking about entropy, again, it's, it's, just a, it's just a natural phenomena based on statistics and probabilities. So take this nice bowl of beans or whatever these are, and we have this low entropy system. And imagine taking this one on the left and shaking it. You know, you are going to naturally end up with something on the right with higher entropy because there's statistically more ways for it to be chaotic than what you have on the left. Again, you can, whenever you think of your room, it just always ends up getting messy. There's fewer ways for your room to be um, actually put together and what we'd call clean versus what naturally happens is things just get spread out and chaotic. It's just, it's, it's basic science. Yep. So it happens spontaneously. So if you want to clean your room, you have to input energy to increase that order. That's not something that just happens. I mean, it'd be awesome if your room just naturally cleaned itself, but that's very unlikely to happen. Um, the entropy was first really defined by engineers. So historically, when they were looking at how much energy they should extract from an engine when burning fuel, you know, a chemical reaction, they found that the amount of energy given for work was never... Uh, actually as much as they calculated. So you could think of it as the unavailability, the unavailability of a system to do work. Um, so again, when we're thinking of an, an internal combustion engine, you know, yes, some of the, ga the, the energy gets turned into the expansion of gases and that does work, but any other type of vibrational um, motions, rotational, if it's not expansion, again, it's you can think of it as an inefficiency. So if the engine just gets hot, a hot engine is an inefficient engine. So the cooler it is, the more energy is actually getting converted to work energy. Oh, and then there's a fun link on ooh, the heat death of the universe. You should you should Google this or watch this video. It's it's sort of depressing, but it's you know it's, it's all fun. Um, in chapter six, we talked about state functions. So if you were to hike from the top or from the bottom to the top of this mountain, it doesn't technically matter what path you take. A state function only depends on the beginning and the end and the overall difference. And so we said energy, pressure, volume, temperature, these were all state functions. So we can just say delta E or delta P, delta V, delta T, and that was nice. Well, fun fact, we can say the same for entropy. So we don't have to worry about the path that's taken. All that we need to know is what's the beginning and final state of entropy. So similar to Hess's law, here if we want to know the enthalpy of sublimation, then if we know the enthalpy of fusion, which is melting, and vaporization, then the sum of those 
is just the sum or the sum would be the heat of sublimation. So we'll use this in a similar sense just for entropy. So a few more fun facts. It's always going to be a positive value and it has the units of either joules per Kelvin or joules per Kelvin mole. Uh, again, we've already said this, but as you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, entropy goes up. And then so here, here's just a couple just examples of different substances and their entropy. Can you can see from a liquid to a gas for water, entropy goes up. For bromine, liquid to gas, it goes up. Iodine, it sublimates from a solid to a gas, it goes up. And then even looking at different allotropes of carbon, diamond versus graphite. Again, uh, the reason graphite is, is the more favored one is because it has higher entropy, which is going to be something that tends to favor reaction. Uh, when it comes to molecules, you can see methane to ethane, 186 to 229. Generally, the larger the number of atoms on, this, on these last two points, the bigger the atoms, the bigger the molecules, or the more bonds there are, the more dynamic it can be, and entropy goes up. So again, to predict entropy, one thing we're looking for is our gases produced. If you end up with more gases than before, it probably has an increasing entropy. If the number of gases go down, it'll probably have a negative entropy. If there isn't a net change, if the, delt, if the number of moles of gas is changing is zero, then you could bet that it's probably going to be a relatively small delta S, but you wouldn't really know whether it's positive or negative. So then here's where I would put some of you on the spot in class and say, hey, well, predict whether the entropy change would be positive or negative. And so if you'd like, you can pause the video and then work these out yourself. Go ahead, do, do that. Okay, now we're back. Um, assuming you did or didn't, let's go ahead and answer these. So if we're going to freeze some ethanol, again, we're saying we're going from a liquid to a solid state. That's going to make ethanol more rigid. There's less movement. That is going to be a decrease in entropy. So it would have a negative delta S. If we evaporate liquid bromine and you go to the gas state, that's going to be an increase. If we dissolve glucose, again, glu solids like glucose have a crystalline, highly ordered structure, very low entropy, but dissolving them in the water lets them move around and it's more chaotic, increases the entropy. And anytime you lower the temperature, again, in this nitrogen gas, while it's not necessarily condensing it to a liquid, it would be moving around slower that we learned in chapter five. And so that also would decrease the entropy. So there you go. So if the first law of thermodynamics is that energy is conserved, the second law says that entropy of the universe always goes up. So it doesn't say entropy is conserved. It says in any spontaneous reaction, the entropy of the universe increases. Um, or if we are in an equilibrium, at the minimum, it at least won't go down. It'll just stay zero. So it, to say a reaction happens, the overall entropy of the universe, the sum of the entropy of the system and the surroundings has to be greater to z than zero. Now, notice it doesn't say that they both have to be positive. You can, the entropy can go down in either the system or the surroundings if the other is more positive so that it outweighs it. Um, so again, we, when we talk about open systems, you know, it, it allows for the entropy to go up and things to become more, or sorry, the entropy can go down. Things can get more ordered and structured, but at the cost of the surroundings going in reverse and being more entropic. Now, if we reached equilibrium, I know that word is probably kind of scary for some of you to hear equilibrium again. All that means is that the amount of entropy for system and surroundings is overall zero. Again, the fact these, these values would be equal, but opposite in sign. Uh, so now we have a little bit of math. Now, you've done these calculations back in chapter six last semester. And so we looked at the standard where instead of entropy, we said, what's the standard enthalpy of reaction? And so when we talked about standard conditions, they were carried out at one atmosphere, 25 degrees Celsius. And here's our generic equation. 
And so we would go and look up these values. And then what we would do is we would take the products, times them by their coefficients and subtract the reactants. Well, here it's exactly the same. The only thing different is you're going to look up the values for, en for entropy instead of enthalpy. So if you go to Appendix 3 in the back of the book or Google an entropy table, you'll find values that you take the values of the products, times them by their coefficients, and then subtract the same thing of the reactants. So that's pretty much works the exactly the same way. Now, recently we've been looking at equilibrium expressions and whenever there was a coefficient, we made it an exponent, but we're not doing that here. So it's just like what we did last semester. So here we want to know what would be the standard entropy changes for these following reactions. So you go to Appendix 3 or you Google and say, what's the standard entropy of these values? And when you do that, you're, you're going to then you're going to find them. So we're going to take for A, look up the value of calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And since the coefficients are both one, you just add them together and then you subtract calcium carbonate. So here's what that looks like. So here's calcium oxide. Here is carbon dioxide, so add them together, and then subtract carbon, uh, calcium carbonate. So overall, we have an increase in entropy because we have... Okay, for B, nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia, same thing, you go up and look up the value for NH3, but you're going to multiply that value by 2. And then you subtract the value for hydrogen times 3, and you subtract nitrogen times one. And so if we do that, oh, too far. We, here we have ammonia, two times 193, because two is its coefficient. Then we have nitrogen's value. We have hydrogen's value times three, because its coefficient was three. So on this one, on, on A, we had a positive value because we were producing more uh, more products than reactants in the decomposition. But for B, it's negative because we're ending up with less moles of gas than when we started. So again, A made more products, B consumed more reactants in terms of how many particles there actually were. On C, we get 20, which notice it's about 10 times smaller than the others. So overall, the delta N was zero for at least gases. So very, very small, a very small increase in entropy. Um, so again, but all of these can be calculated under standard conditions. Now on the quiz and the test, you'll see some that just say, well, what is the value of entropy? What's the sign, positive or negative? So we have hydrogen and oxygen making water. Um, and so what we do is we look and see that there are three moles of gas making two moles of liquid. So we get <coughs> going from a gas high chaotic entropy state to a lower entropy liquid. This is going to have a, a negative entropy sign. For B, we're getting the dissolution, the dissolving of ammonium chloride. Oh, actually, I'm lying. I just didn't actually look. We're getting a decomposition, but a solid making these different gases. So pretty much the reverse of A, that's going to have an increase of or a positive entropy sign. And for C, we have two moles of gas making two moles of gas. Now, you couldn't you you wouldn't really be able to necessarily predict a, a relative magnitude. Um, you could say because you have two substances becoming one, it's going to be more uniform. And so that's going to lower the entropy. So it's probably negative, but it's going to be a really small value because there's no change in moles of gas. And we can, there, there are some solutions, but you can look at those in the notes. So what we want to be able to do is calculate, you know, how the entropy is going to affect our system and how it affects the surroundings. So keep in mind that if we have an exothermic reaction, it's releasing heat and the surroundings 
with this more thermal energy is going to get more entropic as heat goes up, entropy goes up. So generally, exothermic reactions make the surrounding and making the surrounding entropy go up. In contrast, if it's endothermic, if our system is pulling it, thermal energy from the surroundings, then the temperature goes down, it cools off, it's going to have lower entropy. Um, and so those two are strongly connected. So we have this relationship that the change in entropy of our surrounding is proportional to the, the entropy of the system, just opposite in sign. But if we want these to be equal, we just simply throw in a, a temperature. So take the entropy, take the entropy. So if we know the enthalpy change and divide it by the current temperature, then we know how the, the change in entropy of the surroundings is going to be. Uh, so after the second law says that entropy is always going to go up for a spontaneous system, the third law is that pretty much just entropy goes up with temperature. Um, and in going reverse, as you approach absolute zero for a perfect crystalline substance, um, entropy would go down to zero. So if we had a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin, we would say there would only be one microstate, and that would be the lowest entropy possible. So going back to this equation where entropy is the Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of W, the natural log of one is zero. So we could say at under these conditions, there would be no entropy, but we're pretty much never ever gonna be there. So we're looking at relative changes in entropy. So to combine entropy and enthalpy, uh, we can thank Josiah Gibbs down here with this nice beard. Um, so he worked out how these two affected to make a reaction either spontaneous or not, and also the dependence on temperature. And so we have this grand culmination of an equation called the Gibbs free energy, again, named after Josiah Gibbs. And so delta G is equal to delta H, the enthalpy of our system, minus the temperature and the changing entropy of our systems, which again, earlier we said this value right here is actually equal to the enthalpy of the surroundings. Uh, and so overall, we're looking at how these two combine to give us this value. So the way it works is if this value ends up being negative, you consider that spare free energy that there's some energy left over after a reaction or some process has occurred. So if this value ends up being less than zero, we can say the reaction is spontaneous. If it's greater than zero, we would say then, you know, it, there's not enough available free energy to do this reaction and it's not spontaneous. Or you could say, we'll write it in reverse and it's spontaneous in the opposite direction. And then finally, if, if you do reach equilibrium, then the delta, delta G is zero and the reaction is, is done when, when you reach equilibrium. So again, notice this, this temperature factor. Now, the, the way I've always thought about it is, again, think of, think of these two quarters. You could flip, or sorry, one quarter, flip them in one direction and you could either get two heads or one head, one tail, um, but there, there's not that many ways for it to be disordered. Now imagine if you have a hundred quarters. So there is a, a, a much greater number of ways for them to be disordered. And so when you do that, when you add more quarters, you're making the distribution of up and down, heads and tails greater and greater. So when we talk about greater temperature, when there's more energy or technically more matter, you increase um, things favoring higher and higher entropy, things more chaotic. So as temperature goes up, it doesn't affect the enthalpy. It only makes this entropy factor increase. And then here's a fun um, Ted Ed video that talks about, I think we watched it last semester, but it's, it's there if you want to watch it again. So now if we want to calculate the standard free energy, to figure out whether this reaction should go forward or not under standard conditions, we do the same thing. We can look up these fun values. Oh, that's off. 
I got to change that, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, okay, that's better. So if we have our generic reaction, we can go and look up these values for um, the standard free energy of reaction of reactants and products. And again, it's, it's the products times their coefficients minus the reactants. Um, again, and here's the general ex expression. So you, you'll go and look up standard free energy of formations, uh, just like I mentioned for entropy and just like what we did last semester. So just like last semester when we talked about standard entropy or enthalpy, oh, there's a bell. For any element in its most stable form, we say the value is zero. And then other compounds and other charges other phases will make it either go up or down. So for graphite reacting with oxygen to make CO2, you can know that these first two are gonna be zero and then CO2 is gonna be something else. And so it's CO2's value minus the carbon and oxygen to get the standard free energy reaction for just CO2. And again, if this value is positive, we know it wouldn't happen. If it's negative, we know it is spontaneous and it will happen. Now, again, just because we know it's spontaneous doesn't tell us about the kinetics. It doesn't tell us whether this reaction is fast or slow, just whether it would actually happen or not. So here we have the, we wanted the free energy change for combustion of methane and the decomposition of magnesium oxide. And so you go and look up these values um, we know for oxygen in both of these, it's zero and magnesium is going to be zero. But for all the other ones, you're going to have to go and look it up. So for methane and oxygen, here's as the products, we look up their values, 50.8, oxygen is zero. Here are the products. And when we plug everything in, we end up with a negative 818. So we can say that this reaction is spontaneous because of that negative value. Uh, for B, we have this decomposition and we, we, again, we look up the values for magnesium and oxygen, which are both we could predict to be zero. We look up the value for magnesium oxide, which is negative 569.6, and we multiply that by two and we end up with positive 1,139 kilojoules. Again, this positive value tells us that this reaction is not favored to go spontaneously, which we've done this one for Fire Friday. You just light magnesium and it spontaneously does go in the reverse direction. But this magnesium oxide breaking apart is not spontaneous. Okay, so again, this, this is a, probably the biggest part, the biggest, the most important thing in this chapter is that Gibbs free energy is the enthalpy minus temperature times entropy change. So again, we think of this delta G as how much usable energy can be extracted if, again, it does not tell us how fast it goes. So if it's an exothermic reaction, then delta H is negative. We know that's going to favor because it's favored spontaneity because it makes this delta G more. And now we can say from this negative T delta S, if entropy goes up, that also favors the reaction. However, that one is dependent on temperature. So with that, we can then look at this nifty graph or table, not a graph. So we can see that if, if you have a reaction that is endothermic, it takes in energy, positive delta H, but it increases entropy, then it's going to favor being spontaneous at high temperatures where the entropy outweighs the enthalpy. However, if, if you have it endothermic and it decreases entropy, there's no way delta G could ever be negative. So this reaction would never be spontaneous and would not happen. However, you flip, here's, again, if you really want a reaction to go forward all, all the time, if it's exothermic and increases entropy, then at, whatever, at all temperatures, it's going, to be, um, it's going to be spontaneous. However, if it's exothermic, but it decreases 
entropy, it would only be spontaneous at low temperatures because as temperature goes up, the entropy factor goes up and would make it non-spontaneous as soon as delta G hits zero. So again, let, as an example, let's, let's look at um, again how these things kind of weigh in together. So here we have some salt being added to water. That, that's fun, and you know that salt dissolves. But let's think about all the different things that combine. So when you add, so for salt to dissolve, you have to break apart the crystal lattice. And again, anytime you break bonds, um, that's generally going to take energy. So it's endothermic. So this delta H for breaking NaCl is positive, but also breaking it apart increases entropy. Um, so that both those factors come into play. Um, but then we also have water having to get rearranged. So again, it, to, to break water apart is endothermic to break hydrogen bonds. But because it's more chaotic, uh, or sorry, because you're, you're, you're breaking apart hydration shells, which are what you're seeing in the top right, um, I'm sorry, forming hydration shells, then it's actually more ordered than water by itself. So that decreases entropy. So in terms of hydration, when these two combine, again, it's exothermic. These are what we called ion dipole um, charges, and that's favorable um, and little entropy here. But then most, most importantly, the overall, overall, the enthalpy is positive. It is a it takes energy, it takes thermal energy to dissolve, and the entropy is positive. So it's more chaotic when it dissolves. So using these together, we have the overall Gibbs free energy is negative nine. So the fact that delta G is negative tells us that this is a spontaneous process. Again, here's another example looking at calcium carbonate. So if you want to break it apart, you can simply heat it up calcium oxide to calcium dioxide products. Now, normally you wouldn't see this being spontaneous because at normal temperatures, it's not. So let's look up the values. Ta-da, there they are. And then let's use our equation. <clears throat> so we have our 178. It's positive, so that doesn't generally favor spontaneity, but the en entropy of this reaction is 160, which does favor spontaneity. So at zero degrees, sorry, at 25, at standard conditions, the delta G is positive 130. And because it's positive, it's not favored. So if we, if we set delta G to zero, we can then figure out at what temperature would it reach equilibrium? And we find that it would take 1,108 Kelvin so at that temperature, we've reached equilibrium, which means if you go above that temperature, which is why up here you see this, these molten red hot materials, then at those temperatures, you can then drive this reaction forward. Again, here's a look at um, the, the product CO2 as temperature goes up, nothing, 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 but it's not till these high temperatures where it favors, uh, favors the right side. Okay, another way we can use this is for phase changes to see um, when they're going to occur based on temperature. So again, at phase changes, we're saying we know that's in equilibrium, and so delta G, our free energy, is equal to zero. Um, so we want to know then at give these given values, so we are enthalpy, our entropy, then at these given temperatures. So let's look at vaporization of water. So from a liquid to gas is vaporization, from a gas to liquid is condensation. And we have this value. There we go, that looks better. So this is the heat of, <coughs> heat of formation for a given phase change or a given substance. And here's our temperature. So if we go to table 11.8 or Google to find these values um, for water, we have 40.79 for it to vaporize. That's the heat of vaporization. Um, and that occurs at 100 Celsius or 373 Kelvin. And so we can calculate that to be 
109 joules per Kelvin. And so this would be the change in entropy. So again, we're calculating the change in entropy for vaporization of one mole of water. So we can do this for pretty much anything. Here we have an example where we want to know um, what's the entropy change when benzene goes from solid to liquid and from liquid to gas. And we're given the given melting points and freezing or free and boiling points. And again, these are relatively simple. So again, we're given the heats of fusion and vaporization up above. So we just need to, you know, use that equation to say when at equilibrium, delta G is zero. So then we can use this equation, which oh, I'm going to change. There we go. That looks better. So we have the heats of formation over the temperature at, at those to get entropy. So again, pretty straightforward. Here's the heat of fusion for melting. You'd look up 10.9. Now to make our units consistent, um, we have it times a thousand to go from kilojoules to joules and divided by our temperature in Kelvin to get 39 joules per Kelvin per mole and that's for melting. And then for vaporization, we have this higher value of 31 kilojoules for, ent for enthalpy um, divided by its boiling po point temperature in Kelvin. And as expected, we get a greater increase in entropy for vaporization than just for melting. So now the equilibrium part. So again, we, we're saying if we're at equilibrium, then the value is going to be zero. Now, technically, this delta G will vary as the reaction um, goes on. So as we progress, delta G changes um, until eventually when it's done, it reaches a value of zero. So to make things a little bit more simple, we we're going to be using the standard free energy change, which would be constant. So we're all we're more interested in is what is the sign? Is it positive or negative? But together we have this. So our free energy change is equal to the standard free energy change plus RT natural log of Q. And yes, Q is the reaction quotient. So it's kind of like big K, except not at equilibrium conditions, or it could be, but not necessarily. T is our temperature in Kelvin, and R is the gas constant, which is just given. So there's that, and there's that, and there's that and some more stuff. So if we're at equilibrium, then this equation simplifies down to negative RT natural log of K, which is just the equilibrium expression. So for a given reaction, if we're starting with pure reactant, so up here on the top left, notice we have this highest point of free energy. And then as the reaction progresses, this value goes down, 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 and then back up. And then here we have this lower value of free energy. So since this overall value is going down, our delta G is negative, and this would be spontaneous. However, if it were to somehow try to go from this lower delta G to a higher delta G, then that's positive. Again, under this situation, we would say it's not spontaneous or it would be spontaneous in the reverse. So what we call products here would be reactants going to going to the products. I don't really care for these graphs. Yeah, they're, they're, there's a whole lot going on. Uh, again, you can see the, the bottom point is the equilibrium position where Q is equal to K. So it's reached equilibrium or delta G is equal to zero in both cases. So here's more ways to say at equilibrium, um, delta G is going to be zero. The natural log of K will be zero and K is equal to one. However, if K is greater than one, that's when we talked about it favoring the products. So that's not at equilibrium. If K is less than negative one, reactants are favored and when it's like 0. 0.00005 10 to the negative 22nd it's going to favor reactants again these aren't would not be at equilibrium so here we have a problem we want to know what is the equilibrium constant if we measure the if if we know uh from appendix three 
um, our values. So we already have the delta G of reaction shown. I don't think I meant for that to already be shown. Uh, but again, from this tabulated data, we could find the standard free energy of the reaction. And so similar to a previous problem, we look up the values for hydrogen and oxygen, which are zero, subtract the reactants, which was water times two, and we get positive 474 kilojoules per mole. Again, that positive tells us this was not a spontaneous reaction. But this is what we're going to plug in to our delta G. So again, we're trying to find the equilibrium constant. So then if we have that value, again, multiply by 1,000 to get joules, we have our negative R, which is a constant just given. Our temperature at standard conditions was 298 Kelvin. And then natural log of K, which is what we were after. So we multiply on the left, divide by negative 8.3 and 298 and so we end up with the natural log of our const our equilibrium constant is equal to negative 191.5 um, then we take our anti-log we we take the the anti-log raise it to e and we get 7 times 10 to the negative 84th and so that very 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 small value tells us that yeah water does not spontaneously decompose it's not favoring so we could get that from either this very, very small K or the fact that delta G was very, very, very positively large. Okay, again, on, on this problem, we want to find um, what is the, the delta G, the Gibbs free energy, if we know the equilibrium constant. So here we're having the dissolution of silver chloride, which we would normally say is not soluble but we have this really tiny value of capital K. So writing the equilibrium expression, we have silver chloride, oh, and then here's, here's just all of it. Where'd it go? Um, we have silver ion times chloride ion giving us this value. So that's really the only part we need here. And so our delta G, Again, at equilibrium, we have that equation. Delta G is equal to negative RT, natural log of the constant. We have our gas constant times our temperature times the natural log of the equilibrium constant to give us 56 kilojoules. And again, the fact that it's positive tells us that it's only slightly soluble because that would a positive value favors the left. So we'd say, oh, that's non-spontaneous. Okay, this next one goes pretty much exactly backwards. So we want to, oh, I'm lying. It works pretty much exactly the same. We're just working with gases. Um, and so we have these partial pressures of NO2 and N2O4, and we have the standard free energy change of positive 5.4, and we have this equilibrium constant. Um, we want to know what's delta G at these pressures. So Again, we've had this re this equation before, and we're given the standard free energy of five, and instead of capital K, we're gonna work out Q, which is, um, again, the reaction quotient. So looking at our equation, again, to get the quotient, it's NO2 pressure, but squared on top because of that coefficient. On bottom, it's N2O4, but to the first power, because its coefficient is one, and we have our constant R, our temperature, 298 Kelvin. Again, we're taking the natural log of that, and we're given 5.4 kilojoules, but we need it to be in joules, so times 1,000. And taking all of these fun things together, we get a value of negative 3 kilojoules per mole. So the fact that this is negative tells us that this is a spontaneous. It would go spontaneously go forward from these initial conditions. Okay, this is just a kind of for funsies, but this is if you have any large rubber bands at home, something you can try. So one phenomena that you might, uh, maybe you've noticed before, if you take a large rubber band and you stretch it really quickly, 
um, it'll, there's, there's noticeable warmth to it. Now, if you take like a small rubber band, you might not notice this. You need a fairly large one. And normally it's, if we were in class, I would have you do this and I'd have you, um, essentially touch it to your lips cause they're very sensitive to temperature change. So if you stretch it, it feels warm, or if you stretch it and then leave it there for a little bit and then re relax it, release the tension, it'll actually feel cold. So what's happening is rubber molecules in a rubber band normally are in this very high entropy state on the left, but when you stretch it, it elongates these long molecules and goes to a lower entropy state. And again, going back to these equations, we find that as you increase the entropy, we've, we've mentioned this before, as you increase the entropy, um, at least when you release it, it is ex or endothermic, so it has to take in entropy. Whereas if you, when you stretch it, you're decreasing entropy and it, it is, it in, in contrast, releases thermal energy. And so this is, there's a write up in the book you can read about this. Maybe if you have some large rubber bands, you can try it, but we won't do it in class because you're, you're not here, I don't think. So one of the last few things in this chapter are looking at coupled reactions. So this is actually a huge, huge, huge role that's played in biological reactions to get pretty much every amino acid coupled, your DNA, any enzyme, they pretty much all require coupled reactions. So imagine this weight A on this little pulley, and would we expect this weight A to spontaneously go up? And the answer would be no, it's non-spontaneous. However, what if you hook onto it a heavier weight B? So if B is somehow connected to A, as B goes down, it would cause A to spontaneously go up. And so that, that's kind of what we're interested in to end this chapter, is how can you make things that are non-spontaneous become spontaneous? And it's by coupling them. So most biological reactions are energetically unfavorable, and they rely on the surplus of free energy released from, uh, released from energetic molecules. So by far, the most common one is ATP, which... Um, remember, is found in the powerhouse of the cell. That's where it gets produced, the mitochondria. So when ATP, which is like the, the cell's battery, undergoes hydrolysis and releases a phosphate group, there is 31 kilojoules of energy as it gets converted to adenosine dye instead of triphosphate. And that, that's a good helping of energy. And so this is something that gets used throughout every single cell of your body. Um, Hold on, this looks weird. Okay, I'm back. I should mention that all my PowerPoints I had to convert to Google, whatever it's called, the Google version. What is it called? I don't remember. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of things that got got moved around. Anyway, imagine you want to make a dipeptide. You just want alanine and glycine, the two smallest amino acids, to make allyl glycine. So the entropy or the, the Gibbs free energy is positive 29 kilojoules. This is a non-spontaneous process. Again, for these amino acids to make a protein, the free energy goes up and that, that is not favorable. However, if you couple the hydrolysis of ATP, throw in ATP and water along with this, then this reaction can happen. You get an overall release, remember it, Remember, ATP hydrolysis, hydrolysis released 31 kilojoules. Well, alanine and glycine require 29. And so together, when coupled, you get an overall delta G of negative 2. So as you metabolize sugar, um, again, we said the metabolism, the aerobic respiration to make ATP, that is negative. And so as ATP forms ADP, then together, the free energy it has in excess is able to drive these non-spontaneous reactions. Another place this comes up is in the hydrophobic effects. Just this is we've in previous chapters, we've just talked about, hey, like dissolves like and non, non uh, unlike polarities don't dissolve. Well, we, we can talk again about these in terms of entropy. Um, so again, the hydrophobic effect is when we see that nonpolar things tend to stick together. 
So when you have a small amount of nonpolar stuff in water, it can technically dissolve in small amounts because water can form what are called clathrates, clathrates around them. Um, so essentially these little cages, but if you can imagine these cages are highly ordered, that decreases entropy, which means that does not favor their formation. Now, again, it can happen in small amounts, but as more and more nonpolar stuff exists and more cages need to be formed, then again, that further decreases entropy. So what tends to happen is instead of these clathrates forming, if the nonpolar stuff sticks together, then there's less water that has to be forming a clathrate and they're more free to then go and venture off and be chaotic. Um, and this allows for entropy to go up. And so anytime you can increase entropy, it's going to favor this reaction. So again, we also see this with proteins. Um, you generally find that inside a protein is a bunch of nonpolar stuff. Um, and it's polar on the outside that can interact with water. But if you heat up a protein and it unwinds, then it will lead to aggregation or in precipitation. Again, that's because all of the hydrophobic stuff cluster together. Again, it, it decreases or increases entropy when this happens. And here's, here's some fun videos you can watch about that. Okay, and with that, that is all of chapter um, 17 slash 18. I'm sure you might have questions. Um, so work through the homework. And at some point this week, I will probably tell you, I'll probably offer a Google Hangout. So if you don't have that app available, because um, I prefer that over Zoom because we can just use our same Shiloh email Google accounts. Uh, but email me if you have any questions. If you want face-to-face -face contact, we can do that. So just let me know. Okay, so, so goodbye.